morning, South Africa. Good morning to all the entrepreneurs out there that are busy building apps to turn them into a business. My name is Andy Kumalo, and I will be your host for this next 90 minutes where you and I are going to be asking the all-important question of how do I turn my application into a business. Thanks to the good friends at MTN Business and, of course, the App of the Year program we've been able to gather here today for this masterclass. Now, many of you guys have gone through the process of uh, coming up with a really great idea, thinking you're going to be solving a really important problem, building a technology around it, testing it, fixing bugs. Now it's out there. People are taking uh, notice of it. But now the big challenge, how do I make sure that I'm generating revenue, I've, I'm keeping control of my costs, and I am making a profit? Well, if you're thinking about how to do that, you are at the right place. You're also thinking about the fact that, you know, as a startup, you don't have endless um, and, uh, and uh, what did they say, a bottomless pit of cash, right? You may also not have investors. So you may be putting in some of your own money. Maybe you're holding a few jobs just to make sure you work on your idea. So you don't have tons of cash to be throwing into different projects. So who's looking after the technology? Who's busy trying to help you raise funding? And, and also, who is out there trying to sell this to customers? And how do I even find the customers? These are all the questions that we're going to be answering today at this MTN Business Entrepreneurship Masterclass on how to turn your app into a business. Now, the MTN Business team has launched this App Academy, which many of you guys that are joining us today are a part of. It's a five-week virtual training program teaching aspiring and upcoming app developers how to code and build their own apps, preparing them for a future in ICT and also in app development. 72-hour long hackathon has also happened where learners were put to the test. Students had to use their skills that were acquired through the five weeks to develop solutions that were relevant to solving uniquely South African challenges and problems. Now, this entrepreneurship masterclass is now designed to assist learners on how to build a business around their solution. So you may have a solution, you may have a product, you may have tested it, you may have even stress tested it. You may have given it to a few test cases who've used it. It works. Now, how do I build a business? Slightly different skill, and that's what you're here for. So we're going to help you think about how you actually sell to customers. How do you go from a great idea, great application to great business? And also, we're lucky enough to have one of the best VC firms in South Africa. And far as, I'll even go as far as saying the continent. And uh, they're going to be helping us think about how to even pitch it to an investor so you can get cash to get more traction from your business. We're going to be doing this in a, in a form of a panel discussion. We've got previous winners of the MTN App of the Year Awards who are successful in actually building a business as a result of uh, building their product and their solution. And of course, industry experts who have helped many other people do the same, including um, the VC funder I told you about. Please do share all the things that you're learning today through your social media, particularly on Twitter. Our hashtag is hashtag MTN App Awards and hashtag Recode the World. Ask any questions you might have in the comment session, in the chat session, send them through. I'm going to get them right here in studio and I'll be able to put them to the different panelists. Do me a favor, tell me which panelists you'd like to, ask the, to answer your question. That way it allows us to make sure that everybody gets a, an opportunity to get their specific question answered. Big thank you to MTN Business for making this uh, very possible for us today. And if you haven't yet decided, do yourself a favor. I've been a judge of this particular competition for many years now. The MTN App of the Year really changes your life. So make sure you go to appoftheyear.co.za and enter your app. Various categories for you to enter. This is the time to do it. Don't be shy. You just stand nothing to lose. What's the worst that can happen? But what's the best that can happen? That's what you should be thinking about. All right, let me introduce my panel to you, and I've got five panelists today. First up, I've got a team, a tag team, in uh, Salvatore Barras and Kiriakos Lulino. He, they are the co-founders of a company called My Brand. They'll tell us more about My Brand. If you've never heard of it, where have you been? These two youngsters, when I think one of them was still a teenager, and the other one just barely over 20, started this business, and they were able to get great investment for it and have it grow as well, even beyond the borders of South Africa. They're going to tell us their story or how they were from great idea, great solution to great business. Then I've got Ndabentle Ngulube. You've heard of pineapple insurance. If not, where have you been? 
are really, really changing the game and disrupting how insurance works and should work. And that, of course, I'm talking about the company called Pineapple. He's the co-founder of Pineapple, Ndabentle Ngulube, and he's also joining us on the panel. Thanks for your time, Ndabentle. And then T.D. Morabi finishes the round of entrepreneurs who've built applications. Uh, T.D. has built a company called Lock Transi. She's the founder and CEO of that company. And essentially what they do is they use technology to give moms and dads worry about where their kids are when they get picked up or dropped off after school particularly with such high levels of crime etc etc that are aimed at children very very useful she'll also be telling us her story and then from the advisory side the kind of the more experienced you know and in this tech startup world the more experienced don't have to have gray hair and these two gentlemen certainly don't have gray hair but they've seen a lot they've been around the block first up is rob mclean he's a managing director of app developer studios they've helped many companies big and small build their applications and also take them to market he'll have a lot of advice for you so make sure uh, that you listen quite closely to his points and also ask him any questions that you might have and my good friend keith van sale is the co-founder co and uh, the head at knife capital and he is one of the biggest suddenly the most active investors in the venture capital space he's a man who's in love with his job does it very very well and um is really a beacon of hope for many of us who are building these applications are not looking for investors so if you are thinking about investors and if you've got questions for investors this is a unique opportunity where you get to ask them exactly what it is they want from you that way you give yourself a much bigger chance of getting the likes of key to invest in your business so that's our panel. Let me remind you once again, the uh, chat uh, uh, session on your screen right now, that is where you throw your questions. Please try and direct them to a specific person if you have someone in mind. If you don't really mind who it is, also indicate that. My team will send me all those questions and I will put them onto my panel before we wrap at about 11.30. Right, so let's get going guys. And um, um, Davent, I'm going to start with you um, because the story of pineapple is very interesting. Um, I read somewhere that you actually went to university and you, you wanted to be a chartered accountant. So I, as a bean counter, I feel like I lost you to the world of tech. But I guess the world of tech really embraced you because you came up with this wonderful thing called pineapple. Just take us back. Tell us one about the application. How does it work? What are the origins of it? Um, the problem you are trying to solve in the insurance space. And then your story of great idea, great solution, did I create a great business? Awesome, thank you very much, Andile. So in essence, Pineapple is a digital first insurance provider. It's all app-based. And essentially we allow you to insure your items merely by taking a picture of that item. So currently we allow you to insure your general belongings, your electronics, uh, furniture, clothing, appliances, etc. And as of two months ago, we've um, jumped into the motor insurance space. So we currently allow you to insure your vehicle as well. Um, the, the, the root story of Pineapple is quite interesting. Um, actually, I didn't know my co-founders until we met through an innovation competition that was being ran by Hanover Reinsurance. And in essence, the reason why Hanover created this competition was because they wanted to harbor tech talent and disruptive talent in South Africa. And they, they were looking around them and they were looking at other, other um, companies in the, in the financial services space. And a lot of these companies were being disrupted by technology. So they wanted to have an active role in developing such talent in South Africa. So they created this competition, which in essence was a six month long full time competition, whereby people who took part in this competition were paid a, a salary for six months, as well as provided office space so that they had the perfect conditions to sort of come up with an innovative idea. And it was through that six month long competition where the initial version of what is now Pineapple was formed. And as the old age saying goes, the, the rest is history. So when you came up with this solution, there were specific problems that you were solving. You guys worked through the competition to find those. You had to go back and iterate and iterate until you come up with the solution. Now, when you look back, do you believe you solved the problem? I, I do believe we're on the right path to solving it. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I definitely believe we're on, the, on the, the right path. Speaking of which, during this time in our competition, we were heavily focused on the design thinking methodology of disruption. And part of that process is putting a, a laser focus on the actual needs of the customer as well as the, the pain points. And it was during that investigative period, if we can call it that, when we actually learned that a lot of people who purchase insurance don't actually really understand how insurance works at its core. 
and that's the premiums that you pay ultimately end up helping somebody else in their time of need. People didn't have this understanding because traditional insurance companies sort of act as a, a veil of complexity. You, you, you don't really know what happens with the, the premiums that you pay on a month to month basis. And the only time you really interact with your insurer is when it comes time to putting in a, a claim. So we wanted to completely, we, we want to reimagine that. We wanted to give people complete transparency as to what actually happens with the monthly premium that you pay. And on top of that, if there's any premiums left over after paying claims, we return that back to the policyholder. So you can see all of that information in real time on our app. But Ndabenta, how then do you make money? Because it sounds counterintuitive to me. Um, you know, when you look at insurance, suddenly I as a customer, I feel like insurance, insurance companies only make money by running away from claims, by repudiating claims, um, by indeed taking my premium and not telling me what's happening to my premium. So here you are, you are challenging, which is great for me as a consumer. But let's talk about the business model now. How then do you make money? So that's a very good question. So we operate on a fixed fee model. So we take a, a percentage of monthly premiums. And the reason why that's so important to us is because we have no incentive whatsoever to deny claims because that doesn't affect our, our bottom line, if you, if you can say that. So by going for a fixed fee model, we actually encourage people to be transparent, to, be, to act in a way that's beneficial for the entire um, insurance pool. That's interesting. Now, I'm sure um, the big boys of the insurance game, Da Bentley, uh, didn't roll out the red carpet for you and say, oh, welcome, you amazing startup that's going to disrupt our model that we've been making tons of billions over the years on. You're most welcome. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they didn't make things easy for you. H how did you overcome that? How were you able to stay your course, notwithstanding what you know, some people that you would be taking business away from uh, may have responded? So there's a, a very interesting quote um, that people, you know, people say in the insurance space in that insurance isn't bought, it's sold. So in essence, there's this idea that if you want to be a successful insurance company, you really have to have deep pockets in order to push that marketing agenda. And on top of that, there's this, this belief that digital sales in insurance, well, digital only sales in insurance is not really a, a viable means to a, a sustainable business. A lot of people in the insurance space truly believe that you really have to have a, a massive um, call center function in order to, to close that gap. And that South Africa in, really, in, in general isn't ready to um, you know, go for the digital first approach. But we've been able to prove that if you actually have a very intuitive and, and immersive experience on your app, you'd be surprised the number of customers who can actually get across the finish line without people having to, to hold their hand. I think in our case, about 69% of customers get from the beginning to the end of the sales process without even consulting an agent whatsoever. And that just goes to show that if you can actually create an experience that makes sense and isn't daunting to the consumer, they will actually you know, find their way around your product. Well, your product is a consumer product. You're selling it to me, everybody that's uh, logged into this webinar and many other people on the street, which also means that you need to get to me. You need to, the <coughs> messaging must come to me one way or the other. Uh, your big competitors have got big uh, budgets, not just for the call centers you, men you mentioned, but also for marketing. How have you gotten your great idea, your great solution to a great business by getting clients? How are you able to talk to the customer for the customer to eventually s take a picture of what they want to insure and uh, buy pineapple? So you're, you're right. Um, you know, our relatively shallow pockets were somewhat of a constraint when it came to marketing. So we knew that we had to focus on the areas of marketing that we are really good at and that we understand, which was social media. So from the beginning of the journey, we were very, very intentional on focusing on building our brand on social media. I remember when we first started out, um, before we had even launched the product, we had a waiting, queue, a waiting list um, on our website where people can go in and add their email to a, a mailing list. And in essence, once you add your, your email to that list, we show you where exactly you are in the queue in terms of getting early access to Pineapple. And the more times you shared the, the link that we gave you on our website to your social media, the more people that, brought, that came back um, using your link, we bumped you further and, for, and further forward towards the front of the queue. And off of that, we're able to build a, a massive um, initial mailing list. But on top of that, on Instagram, we made sure that we wanted to interact with our people as someone would on their personal accounts. I think the big problem with a lot of corporates and the, the, the way that they use social media is they use it as a, a one-way communication channel. They don't really want to interact with the people that follow them 
and so forth and build that level of, of rapport. But we were very intentional in doing that and so much so that within about five or six months of starting that Instagram page, we had about 25,000 followers of our, of our page. Wow. And to put that into perspective, um, at that same time, the traditional guys were probably averaging about 200, 250 followers compared to us who managed to get to about 25,000 just by providing that human experience and that human interaction from our page to the people who followed us. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Ndabenka, for engaging us this morning. Really great story, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of questions coming from everybody who's tuned in this morning for you, and we'll get to, uh, to you a little bit later on. Let me go to the tag team, and that's uh, Salvatore and Kiriakos from my brand. Gentlemen, I hope you're well. You're looking very suave over there, all dressed up in jackets and stuff. I bet you don't look like this every day. So thanks for dressing up for all of us today. Um, tell us your story. Talk um, so, uh, you were solving like for, but also just like more information on how you were able to take this great idea into a great solution and into a great business. So, uh, Angelia Kiriakos met and, uh, and I met about five years ago. Um, when we came together, we came up with the idea that there was a, there was a lack of aggregation tools available at the time, the, the five years ago. Um, by aggregation, I mean uh, instead of opening up five different websites, tools that aggregate things all into one place. So similar how Flipboard would work with your news, where it would aggregate all your news content from across the internet and combine it into, into one place for a user to browse through. We saw that there was a lack of um, aggregation tools in the retail and e-commerce space. So we designed my brand to be a place where users can browse local stores and their specials. We wanted to create a digital ecosystem where the user could easily find and share content from the brands that they love. Um, nowadays, consumers don't have one digital outlet to browse through and specifically search for deals. So we're trying to move store catalogs and print media uh, into the digital space. So instead of reading through your pick and pay catalog that you get with your newspaper at the end of the month, you'll be able to access that same content through one centralized place. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what we've been, that's what we've been building. Um, and yeah. And how uh, was the initial think, response, gents, when you came up with this? I mean. From a consumer perspective, I can see the benefit, right? I mean, there's only so many knock and drop newspapers I can receive at my house and page through all of the local sports news and netball news before I get to the specials from my local grocer. So I can totally see why, you know, a digital platform would work. But, you know, I may be kind of the customer or the user, but, you know, the client is the advertiser, right? The client is the pick and pay. I got to convince that guy that this is the right platform for him and not, you know, uh, maybe the Sandron Chronicle or the Four Ways, whatever. How was the response from those customers and, 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 and how much traction were you able to get soon after you launched? So uh, in the beginning, we faced a bit of a catch-22 where you need the customer, as in the retailer, to get the user. But the only way to incentivize the retailer was to get more users. So the retailers only want to speak, speak to you if you've got thousands of users and the users will only download your app if you've got a large amount of retailers on the platform. Um, so in the beginning, we, we obviously the retailers saw the value immediately, but we found that the growth wasn't big enough for us to grow our users. Uh, so we, we approached a different model where we signed on everyone. We, we call it the Google model where we sort of aggregated everybody's specials, everybody's stores in one place uh, and then move forward into trying to get them to pay us to prioritize their content. It was, it was actually a major shift. Mm -hmm. Model where initially the, the, the app had been designed with a charge a subscription for businesses to be on this platform. But what we quickly realized was that there's something, this wasn't something that was scalable. Um, and this is actually was, we had a big shift in our business where we started incorporating um, artificial intelligence and machine learning into our platform, where we started automating a lot of the tasks that we were usually hiring staff to do. So, for example, when we were sitting manually uploading specials, um, we designed algorithms that were really input this this content so um yeah that that catch 22 has always been a difficult thing for us trying to find that and i think for a lot of businesses uh, that rely on users and businesses uh, they, they exist that that line that you, you need one to get the other um i think that's something that a lot of or developers we've spoken to it's something that a lot of them difficult yeah. a lot of them face um, so how did you do it then so so you say you signed up everyone i mean uh, that that's that i suspect is a lot harder done than you've just said so how did you do it how did you make sure that you had the audience before you go to the advertiser um and and of course 
uh, that costs money, right? I mean, that's not free. So we thought to ourselves, obviously, let's go for the user first. Um, obviously, it will be easier to get the businesses on once we've got these users. Using that, uh, our AI and our machine learning algorithms that we had built, um, we started automatically uploading these stores. And so what our, what our tools would do, our part would go, we'd give it a bunch of domains, it would land on these domains, figure out, is this a retail, a retail store? Is this a shopping center? Is this a product? It would sort all of that data for us and spit it back. So what we were left with was probably uh, one of South Africa's most com com comprehensive lists on retail spots. So we have a list of um, a map basically with 300 franchises. I think it's over 12,000 stores. So the idea was man automatically upload all these stores, grab whatever content that they're putting into the public domain and then make that accessible to the users. So through doing that, we saw a major up uh, uptake in the product. So our drop off rate went from something like 0 0.3 to a good 10. Um, so that allowed us now to start. We, didn't, we weren't relying on businesses to go into a back end and upload their own content where it was, it was all available. So, better way so in a them. way, you gave them free advertising. You, you, you allow them to put out their messaging for free so that you could get the audiences interested. And I guess you also served the audiences based on their own interests, right? Um, and, and then how were you then able to move from kind of the introductory free offer to generating some income for them? Uh, so indeed, I think this is going to, I hope we can cover this topic some more. So a big thing for us app developers is obviously getting in the, so number one is the income with these things. And number two is getting in the door with these retail businesses. So one thing we find that app developers, sometimes the mistake they make is it's very money focused. When you're building a product, we find this was a mistake that we made for a long time. When you're designing a product or a tool, a screwdriver, you don't design a screwdriver or a chair to make money. You design a screwdriver to screw in screws and a chair to sit on. So a lot of app developers try initially to focus on building the model, but there's a lack on the actual product side. So we've actually had a lot of arguments with investors about this. They, they hate the story. Um, we're of the belief that it's obviously very unconventional where you want to master a tool and actually build a tool that has use in the real world and not something that's just full of functionality, but actually has no, um, actually has no use. And in, in terms of income, and this was something that I'd love, I think this was a huge turning point for us as well. I think it's important as a, as a product developer to always identify where your strengths are as well as your weaknesses, your strengths and your skills, and look at how that can be packaged and sold to the public. So that's what we did. Um, our first actual, our first customer turned into an investor and it was a thing of the investor seeing the skills that we were using in this product and packaging and selling it back to him so he could use it in his own business. So that's always been a, a, a big cash flow uh, and income for us. Um, actually selling these skills that we're building like, into our own product to other businesses. Um, That's interesting. So I also, I also found out that you, you were able to raise some money um, and yes. you referenced already some difficult conversation with investors. Just update us on what you were able to do on the investor side and um, how then did you get over that argument of support me in creating a really great screwdriver, a really great chair, and we'll figure out how to sell the chair or the screwdriver. How were you able to get through that with those investors that you were able to secure? Uh, so our investors were actually our first client. Um, they, they liked the product and they, they wanted to buy in. Uh, they were also expanding their business, so they saw the product as uh, uh, an integral part of right. growing their business. But with regards to your second question, how did we get through to them, to be honest, uh, we didn't actually manage to, and we've since we've since sort of acquired back uh, the shares that they purchased, and we've we've gone completely independent now, um, purely because of that lack of. Do control. you think that's a problem in the ecosystem? Do you think that's that's a challenge? Yes, especially in this country, I think investors are looking very short term. Um, but again, I've I've only, I haven't had like many experiences with them, so I don't oh. want to speak for all of them. We do find that, that uh, corporates in this country want to wanna look very short term and they also have their own idea in the head of where, where the industry is going and where it should be going. Uh, and they don't like that whole build it and they will come uh, model. Yeah. Uh, if you think about Google, Google don't charge you to be on Google. Uh, they they, they want to get everyone on Google yeah. they want to the user, give the user exactly what they want no matter who's paying what. Uh, and then once they have enough users, they then charge companies to prioritize uh, their, their results. 
right. in order. So Salvatore, have you been it. able to generate income now? Is, is, it, is, that, is, there, is there something kind of ticking on the top line or, or are you quite comfortable that let's focus on the chair? Uh, look, Adilius, like, like I said, we've, a lot of the past five years, we've been packaging. So as our skills have got better through developing my brand, we've obviously packaged that and been able to sell it back to the, back to the, um, the, the public. So that's actually what, how we've been funding my brand. Is. So initially it was on our investment, which we've since paid back. Um, we did charge for my brand for quite a long time. For two years, we were charging per store. We had over 2,000 stores, but it just wasn't scalable. Uh, ideally, I mean, we weren't going to be going, you know, flying around the province, sending, uh, getting sales teams together to try to sell the store to door. Um, and that's why, we, that's why we pulled the plug on, on that model in that way and decided to make it free. So, again, just getting income in has been the thing of packaging our skills. So, we've done a lot of app development jobs, uh, advertising, anything where we've shown value within my brand it's very easy to sell back to a customer. And even um, App of the Year, having something like App of the Year on your, on your resume really makes for a great uh, um, first impression. Um, and it kind of sells, it gives confidence to our potential yeah. clients. And our Brilliant stuff. Look, we're going to go back to some of those comments around investors. I can already uh, see my good friend, Keith, uh, salivating um, to give some perspective to some of your experiences. But you know what? Your experiences are valid. They are your experiences. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the advisor side of my panel will be able to give some guidance to many others that are listening in and wondering how does one get over some of those challenges. Thank you so much, gentlemen. TD, let me move over to you. Um, you are a winner of the best women in STEM solution at the app of the year last year, 2019. Um, your business, Log Transy, very cool solution. Tell us your story, your journey. How did you come up with the idea in the first place? How did you build the application? And have you been able to make it a business? Um, okay. Um, I, I came up with the idea because of a, a personal experience uh, when I could not locate my own child. So uh, it was first term at high school. And uh, because it's a new school, and on that particular day, they were knocking off early at around about 10 o'clock. And when I was trying to call the transport driver, um, she was not picking up her phone and um, because it's the first term, first year at that particular school, I got nervous and I went home just to make sure that uh, everything is fine. And when I got here, my daughter was here. So I then said, I thought about it and I thought to myself, this is not fair to us as parents because we need to be notified when kids are picked up and dropped off so that we know where they are. So um, I went to bed around about uh, 10 o'clock and at two o'clock I woke up and I said to myself, I cannot just leave this, uh, this thing as it is, I need to do something. And then I started drafting a functional specification to say, okay, I need a, an app that will notify us and um, that will give us peace of mind as parents because of um, if we don't know where your child is, um, checking the environment of today, you won't, you won't work well at, at, at work as well because now you are panicking. You don't know what happened to your child. Absolutely. That's how the app came about. That's so, brilliant. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and then and the building of it, how did you then from the technicals and the inspiration and the personal experience, which are extremely valid i guess for an entrepreneur in terms of inspiration now it's time to execute how did you do how was that process um i then uh, because lock transit falls under Kinini consulting uh, the company um i then decided to hire a developer to put this idea into uh, into perspective and the development took us like less than three months uh, we started end of March, and by June, we were ready to go out to market. And October, we won two awards uh, from MTN App of the Year Awards. And the uptake in terms of the app, everybody was happy, like the parents, the schools, as well as the scholar transport drivers. Because um, on the app, there are two profiles, uh, three profiles that can be created and two of those can be active at any given point. So the school received it well, the scholar transport drivers as well as the parents. Because when we're speaking to the principals of the school, they will say that the app is actually helping them to manage the kids who are banking school because now the parents will be notified when the children <laughs> are not at school. I see, I see. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad so, the app didn't exist when I was in school. 
Okay, all right, that makes a lot of sense. But you said three profiles, but only two at the same time. Why is that? That's an interesting one. Okay, so um, let's say if, uh, because it's the parent, the scholar transport driver in the school, if the scholar transport driver is not participating, maybe the parent is the one that is dropping off the child at school. So we're gonna, uh, the scholar transport driver won't be in the picture, but the school will be in the picture because they will receive a child and dismiss the child uh, uh, after school. And if the school is not participating, the scholar transport driver will pick up the child and drop off the child. So the parent will be notified. There's an in-app uh, notification. Uh, they will get notification on the app and they will know where the child is, whether it has been, uh, the child has been picked up or dropped off. If the three parties are participating, the parent is the primary party, uh, party. If three parties are participating, then the parent will get six notifications on that day giving um, getting the information to say where the child is. So what the app is actually selling, uh, is actually selling peace of mind because that's what we need as parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I have to ask you, Tidi, my million dollar question when I was reading your story in preparation of this conversation, I was just imagining the headache you must have in trying to get the parent on board, trying to get the school on board, and trying to get the transport guy on board. H how have you solved that? Because all of these people are important, right? Like, you know, the parent may be the one paying, but the school is a key stakeholder. And man, the transport guy is also a key stakeholder. Mm. Okay, I must say the challenge came uh, with the scholar transport drivers because they felt that um, I should have included them when I was developing the app. And they don't, they don't want to use the app because they don't want the parents to track them, to know where they are and stuff like that. I then shifted my focus and say, okay, fine. The parent and the school, they are the one who will be my key um, uh, stakeholders here because the parent wants to know where the child is. So as a, a, the, ch the parent has money, so the buying power stays with her. If she feels that the scholar transport driver doesn't want to participate, then it means they will get another scholar transport driver that participated. I see. And then also created another havoc whereby the scholar <laughs> transport drivers, they were now calling me and say, why am I doing this? And I said to them, I wrote the app from the perspective of a parent, but I can include them in the app whereby they can be able like, to sell the app as a marketing tool for parents to sign up with them. And that's how they came on board and they requested me to put the association on the app so that they can also manage the scholar transport drivers who are not on the association so that they, they at least know who's, who's not in the association and they can include them in the association. Wow. And when it came to schools, the schools, they received the app very well because now they don't have to, uh, they don't have to report to the parent if the child gets injured in the in in, in the car and they yeah. have dismissed the child. Then it means the accountability now lies with the scholar transport driver. Yes. And when the parent has to blame somebody, they will have to blame somebody who has who has um, picked up the child and say, okay. The school dismissed my child, you have picked up the child and the child got injured in your car. Then it means you are more responsible in comparison to the school. So it was actually alleviating uh, other problems that were experienced by the schools as well. Wow, that's a brilliant story. So clearly a great idea. You got to develop it to build a technology. It seems like it's working. It's beautiful in its simplicity. If I could, if I could share my own personal view, I, I like how simple it is because it just works, mm. right? You're solving mm. the problem. Yes. Let's talk about the money yes. part, you know. Um, Salvatore tells me I should worry about whether the screw can screw, the screw driver can screw in a screw. Uh, the accountant in me can't help but worry about uh, does a screw driver sell? So let's talk about the parents. Are they signing up? Are they paying up? Like what do you do when they don't pay? You just don't pick up their kids. Hope not. <laughs> Okay, so um, the app, when it went out last year, it, it went out as a free app. So now, uh, because we have included like COVID-related uh, information on the app, 
whereby when the scholar transport driver picks up the child and they are using a, a, a thermostat, they can actually put in the temperature of the child when they pick up the child and they can make a decision right there to say whether they're going to take the child to school or they're going to leave the child because wow. um, there's a guidance in terms of if the temperature is higher than 38, then it means the child is, 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 is not uh, suitable to go to school. So... Because of we have added that, we have added new features, um, the, the look and feel of the app has changed and stuff like that. So the app will now be sold. It's no longer going to be a free app. The way it went out, uh, because um, I, I agree with my brand uh, team to say when you um, sell a screwdriver, you first, you first want to see if that screwdriver works. And same applies to the app. The uptake was good. So now that we have the uptake, there, there's an appetite on the app. So now it's, it's time to sell the app. So the app will definitely be monetized. And the, the new version is coming out um, sometime this week. And it will be published um, at a cost. Wonderful stuff. So, but I mean, outside yeah. of paying for the app, uh, TD, have you thought of other revenue streams in that entire value chain? I mean, you've got the school, you've got the scholar transport guy, you've got the parent, you've got this process of picking up this valuable uh, cargo called my child. Have you started thinking about potentially other ways you can make some money through that? Um, I have. Um, it's just that it didn't work. Firstly, we started by uh, using the advertising. So we created our own advertising space yeah. whereby uh, we can attract the, your spas or pick and pay to advertise during the pickup and the drop off. And that didn't work. And we also used the ad mob and it didn't work. So now we said, okay, fine, let's rather get the parents or everybody who's involved in the, in the um, app to subscribe. So um, when they subscribe, then we are sure that okay. um, the subscription money will definitely sustain the company. Brilliant stuff, Siri. Congratulations. Great story. I love it. I love it. I love it. We're talking about uniquely South African challenges. And I guess even though that happens all over the world, in our environment, we know we've got very uh, interesting uh, intricacies that you've had to deal with. Well done. Rob and uh, Keith, I, I left you for last on purpose because, Rob, I want to start with you. You've heard the stories of the three entrepreneurs. You've heard at different stages that they're in in their businesses. You've got great experiences in, in, in helping and building applications with small businesses, big businesses. And in the audience today, we've got um, hundreds of young people who've been part of the MTN business program. Um, many others are visiting us today. They're also building their own applications. You've noted some things, I'm sure, in the discussions. I'm looking to you to provide some guidance, some guidance in this whole topic of building an application that one day becomes a business. And, and we've had the screwdriver chair example. Um, we've got a business that's been able to raise capital. We've got a business that had a bad experience in raising capital, bought back their equity. Um, and we've got an application that's just gone now live to be downloaded at a cost as the primary revenue generator. Your thoughts? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so to continue the, the maybe overpressed screwdriver analogy, um, I think what's <laughs> most important when considering building an app is does the technology help? So with a screwdriver, it wouldn't be to build a screwdriver that works because there's very good screwdrivers out there. It would be to build an app that tells you where your screwdriver is if it's been lost or stolen. The technology, geolocation, push notifications in an app, in a telephone, in a smartphone, actually how can the technology help? Because we have... You know, we probably have between five and 15 inquiries every day for people who want us to build their app. We, we build apps, we're App Developer Studio. And quite often we say, well, why would someone download this? How is this app making their life better? Why should this be an app and not a website? Why does, what problem does this solve? How is the technology important? And I think from the, the um, other speakers, a few things stand out for me. Um, you know, the technology helps with pineapple, in my opinion, because it's, by, it's, it's the camera. It's been able to take a picture of a product and share that. And then lots of very clever stuff is happening in the back end. Um, and when we think about apps, we shouldn't just be thinking about what's on the phone. We need to be thinking about the technology in the back end. But it's solving a problem where people don't have to complete a lot of paperwork, 
phone up and wait in call centers, go through many processes, you're making life easier by using the technology through the phone. And I think the fact that, you know, the other thing is, you know that industry, you know insurance, you have an accountancy background, so you know the problem that you're trying to solve. And that industry awareness expertise is super important. And again, I think with Lokanzi, um, you are a mum, you're a parent, you, you, you know the problem, you, have, you had the personal experience. And I think I see that a lot is, is where people are trying to become experts in somebody else's industry. And, and it's right. those people that really know a problem, an industry, a vertical, and then maybe not totally inventing something new, but they are solving an existing problem that they've got first-hand experience of that it works and, and, and you're using Lokanzi, GPS and push notification stuff that only apps can really do to solve that problem. Do I have to figure out how my application will make money at the beginning or do I focus on the product and the solution and at some point figure out how to make money? You know, and, and I remember, and I'm asking this question because many people, Different people come with different answers. I mean, in the early days of this revolution we are on, it was all about the product. It was all about solve the problem, solve the problem. And monetizing was literally an afterthought. Um, in the game now, what comes first? Chicken or egg? I've, I've changed over the years. So my first ever app was highly popular, highly unprofitable. Um, <laughs> and it, been funded by myself, so I don't have the luxury of indefinitely um, putting up with that. My second app that we built, we took the approach, I took the approach, it was a bunny button app, build and they shall come. And we were wanting to charge for it, um, a fee to download, a subscription, very quickly realized, and it's a big problem in the industry for app entrepreneurs, is trying to get people to pay for an app is virtually impossible. We have apps that people pay for, but it's very difficult. People expect stuff to be free. We built it. We realized people wouldn't pay for it, so we offered it for free. But actually, we realized a white label franchising model was the one that would work. So we charge other businesses to, to have versions of that app. And I think that's quite a, a kind of an underexplored revenue opportunity is white label and franchising of apps. Um, I see. But now, so that kind of, that is a case where it did work. Um, we, we have 40 versions of that app and, and it's extended and grown a lot um, in the, over the years. But now people come to us for an app and, and the idea of indefinitely just having an idea and, and it will make money, I don't think, especially if you're going to an investor, if you're going to a VC fund, you have to have a business model. Now, you may get that business model wrong, but you have to envision a way that you're going to pay them back or they're not going to lend money to you. So I think, and it's, it's remarkable and very disappointing how many people come to us and they haven't thought through a business model and they, they actually think that they can get money from app downloads. The, the fact that someone is using an app, maybe magically MTN is paying the app developer because they're using data on the MTN network and it doesn't pay like that. So you, unfortunately, <laughs> in the end, it comes down to it must make money somehow. So I got to think of the business model early in the process. Um, one of those business models that again were popular in the beginning was advertising. I mean, I think TD also mentioned that she said, you know, we tried a few things. We tried to sell advertising. It didn't work. Is that a no-no now, Rob? I mean, is that a, a no-go area? Forget it. To, to a new app developer, you've got to ask yourself, are you going to put adverts in your app and annoy your first users and early adopters and use their data? So I wouldn't recommend putting adverts in there initially because you're not going to make any money because by definition of advertising, you make it based on volume and eyeballs. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a dead business model, but, but genuinely, I, I believe you need at least 20, maybe 50,000 regular users of an app for the, for the revenue from advertising to ever be interesting substantial sometimes sponsorship is an interesting one where it's not advertising where there's randomly generated google ads being being kind of created but 
you can go to a large company, large brand in a same industry or in a associated industry and, uh, and, and they will pay to put their brand to sponsor your startup app. So I think the sponsorship model is for a startup is quite an interesting one. All right, all right. Last question from me, Rob. So guide me now. Are you saying, you're advocating for, if I'm watching this right now, you're saying to me, I got to start thinking about the business model. <laughs> All right, I got I to gotta figure out at least what I think the business model is. H how do I do that? I mean, give me some tips on how I follow the money. Wh who is likely to pay for the product? When I look at the My Brand product, I find it interesting that the same advertisers that were advertising on, you know, the knock and crop newspaper that we all get in our homes um, was not willing to pay for potentially a superior advertising platform that's delivered digitally that's able to give them more data and, 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 as, as the fellas would have sold to them. Um, so comfortable to pay a newspaper, I'm not comfortable to pay a digital platform. So like, as a user, I'm getting the benefit. Should I be paying for that, my brand? Or should ShopRite Checkers be paying for that, my brand? Give me some tips. How do I determine who the client should be, the one who parts with the money? Such a big question. I'm so, so you got to think who's getting value out of it, who's, who's enjoying it. It's very difficult to get the public to pay. The public can kind of accidentally pay through advertising. So they're being paid for their eyeballs. If they click, you make some money. Um, sometimes data is a way of getting public to pay where they must enter their information and you can use that information to do other things with. Um, I think often people are viewing apps as a as an industry it's not it's just one part of existing industries so uber isn't making money out of their app they're making money out of rights they're making whatever percent from selling trips um take lots aren't making money out of their app they're making money out of selling stuff um and the margin on the stuff so often the revenue model isn't the app revenue model it is a business model for the business. They are saving costs. Why do the banks offer great apps and no data? It's to stop you going into the branch, save them some cost. Um, so it, it's not always about uh, the, selling the app, trying to get someone to pay a subscription, in-app purchase, pay to download. Good luck with that, unless, unless um, you've got something truly remarkable. Um, you can pay for a service like um, Kanzi, um, we can sell insurance like pineapple, but, but the app itself is not what's directly making money. But somewhere, someone has to make money um, or save money. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. Rob McLean, Managing Director at App Developer Studios. Hit him up if you need help with your app. Hit him up if you need advice. That's, it. That's the business that he's in. And uh, I'm pretty sure he will help you. Really useful advice there. Keith, my man, I know you got to run at 11 o'clock. So I've given you 12, more, 12 minutes between now and top of the hour because I want us to get into the investment issues. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're out there, this is the time to send me all your questions to Keith because he does need to jump off uh, the call at 11. So please send them now so I can squeeze them in in the next 11 minutes. Keith, you've heard the conversation. You've heard what the guys are saying. Your thoughts, your advice. What do you think? Look, there's not uh, one model that, that fits it all, you know, but I think the first question that an entrepreneur needs to ask themselves at that point is, am I building a product or am I building a business? And this, this may evolve over time, but the difference is now with all the tools available, I mean, Rob mentioned, you know, using the technology, working with it, building a product is, is easier than it's ever been. But building a company is exactly the same as it was 100 years ago when, when Henry Ford built one. You know, you need to focus on your market. You need to focus on this. And where the magic happens is really looking at a large addressable market and a team that can execute into that market. If you can get those two, two things right, you are somewhere there. But, I mean, it has been mentioned today, the third sort of magic element is the awesome product. And, and that's often where, where entrepreneurs uh, kind of miss, miss the plot a little bit around combining all of these, these things. Because at the end of the day, when you look at it from an investment perspective, you have to look at, 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 obviously, you have to assume that the product is awesome. I mean, that's the one thing that the entrepreneur can or should or, or, or has to do. You know, like if you can't be 
average at your product. You know, the 80-20 rule counts there. You need to be in the, in the you know, top quartile, if not the top 5%, to really make it and, and world dominate and, and all these plans of these buzzwords of disrupting, you know, the status quo and so forth. Those are big words, but you can only do that if, you're, if, you're, if your product is amazing that you can execute in a large addressable market. But just to make it more practical, there are many, many studies about why businesses or, or let's call it in this case, apps fail to, to get into that zone of becoming scalable, becoming a business. And how do, you, how do you do that? And the main sort of kernel out of that is that you actually have to scale five things in parallel. You know, so you need to be, none of these things can, can be out of um, kilter with, with each other. And the first one is product. So we've, we've talked a lot about products and screwdrivers and, and chairs and, and all that today. Awesome product, tick. But then you need to really look at, at the customer for that product. That's the second, second element. A lot of real good wisdom here, on, 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 on especially like what the mentor said around um, the fact that they are, are laser focused on the customer experience. You know, things like, um, you know, they're in route of, to solving the problem. They haven't like arrived and think, okay, well, we've solved the problem. So now we built, we've built it. People must now just come. The focus on design thinking you know, the, 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 the things that the, the my brand guys were, were mentioning around um, their customers initially funded their, 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 let's call it runway. You know, we've had one of our best businesses, which we've actually exited about two years ago to Uber. I mean, that's how they, the first year, I mean, they, they built such a good product that one of their customers are saying, listen, please, can, can, can you add these features and, and add it in? to the product and they were like, well, we don't have the money. And they said, okay, well, we'll pay you 24 months up front, you know, just, just, uh, just, just build it for us. And then they obviously could, could sell that. So don't forget that your, your clients could, could, could fund that, you know. Team is the third element. So that team needs to be, you know, if, if, you, if you're still in app building phase, you don't necessarily need a team of 30 people. But at some point you need to think about, well, who's employee number two is employee number three. One of, the, one of the interesting sort of comments from one of the, the top VCs, they said, you know, one of the questions they always ask the entrepreneurs is, why would employee number 20 or 22 join the company? It's easy to, to kind of convince employee number three and four because it's you on this hype curve, but now you're becoming a business. You know, they, they, you need career paths. You need to think about all of those type of things. Business model is the fourth element. Um, and yes, unfortunately, South Africa is, a, is, an, is a, not an ecosystem where things are are really gelling yet between the, where, where the role is that government plays, you know, the accelerators, the entrepreneurs, the funders. I mean, our VC ecosystem is really built on the paying it forward mantra of super angels and high net worth individuals. Very few institutional investors back the space. I mean, if entrepreneurs feel, feel bad that they, that they pitch their hearts out and no funders are listening, Try being a VC and convincing funders that you, they must give you hundreds of millions of rands, which you're going to invest in disruptive technology and, um, and, and hopefully one day in four to seven years from now, exit to the proverbial, however, when there are no IPAOs happening in the space, you know, co-investment is, 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 is difficult, exits are scarce. You know, there, there's definitely some, some structural issues in our ecosystem, which we, we, we don't, can't go in today, but, but yeah, so... And then the fifth element is, is funding. So one doesn't always need funding. So I really am, even though I'm a, I'm a VC, I, I've advised many entrepreneurs that if you can actually bootstrap the business into the entirety and, 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 and own 100% of your business, I mean, why the hell would you want to give an element of it away? But if you exchange a portion of your business for a value-adding partner that also comes with a little bit of a check, then, you know, everyone wins. So at the end of the day, I mean, that's why our fund is actually called KNF, which is knowledge networks and lastly funding, you know? So firstly, if you have enough knowledge on the product, if you have enough networks to, to, to sell and to add value and bring the entrepreneurs more clients, funding should be the window of opportunity closer. So meaning point, point B is over there and it, we can get there maybe in 36 months time. But by then the puck would have moved. So, so if we can, if, if, if that is a problem and you really need to get there in 12 months time, to use an example, that's when you need funding to, to, to close that gap. So yeah, if you, can, if you can balance those five elements and grow them in, in proportion to each other, 
then, uh, then you, that's how you build a business. You have got these five things, product, customer, team, business model, and funding. Product is number one. Business model is number four. Are you suggesting that as a VC, you could quite, shall we say, consciously invest in a business with a great product, a great customer experience or plan, good team, but maybe the business model is not that great? And I'm asking that question because bluntly I want to know, do you buy businesses that don't yet know how they're going to make money, but the product is hot, the team is hot, the customer experience is amazing? Well, yes and no, but no, no. So let's make it clear. All five of those elements need to be there. Otherwise, well, you, you, will, you will not get funding from, from this VC at least. But, um, you know, sometimes you, you really feel that the, the, the team is onto something and, and you, can, you can understand that, that they are solving a real problem. And, and that sort of seed phase investments you know, that it, is, it is possible to say, okay, well, hang on, let's, let, let, let's, let's seed fund this a little bit and then, and then work out the business model as we go along. But I, I do also agree, I think something Rob said, that the, the era of, especially in this ecosystem, of, of build something interesting and then worry about monetizing it later is a very difficult thing for, for a funder to get their heads around. Because, I mean, funders need to they invest and they need to get a return on that investment. And without that business model that you, that you mentioned there, Andile, you know, you, you can't really get there. And those, those, interestingly, are the two worst answered questions from, from entrepreneurs that, that pitch to VCs. First, worst question that they answer is, um, you know, who exactly is your target market? So, you know, to, to, to really unpack that question, it, it, it is not, well, you know, do you know that most, mo, there are more cell phones in Africa than people? And if we can only get 2% of that market, that's our target market. You know, you really need to have a bottom-up approach of, of, of that. And then secondly, the worst answer question is, how exactly do you make money? So, so, so that is really the, the question that, that VCs or funders want to know because of the fact that, you need to understand how long the runway, I mean, cash flow is king. So, you know, if it, it's fine to build an interesting product, but if, if there is no runway and, and, you know, entrepreneurs at some point need to put food on the table and kids into school and, you know, they need to drive those cars somewhere that, uh, that you can insure via pineapple and um, afford them, you know, the, 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 that equation needs to work. So I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And how are they going to make money? Then, and, and, yeah. yeah, before no, I let you go, because I'm worried that we've only got two models. minutes, I've got to go to some of the questions okay, that are okay. being asked, but I think you've answered that question well enough. Very clear, focus on all five, but the two worst answers is, who's your customer and what's your business model? How do you make money? Which, I guess, to be honest, are related. If you're very clear about who your customer is, you should, you know, it kind of follows that you're likely to be able to answer the question of how you make money from them. Keith, I've got a few questions for you here, but the one that keeps coming up is many of the entrepreneurs are feeling like venture capitalists are elusive, unreachable. In fact, somebody calls them an elusive and unreachable bunch. How does one reach them? You know, I don't, I, I think it's, it's, it's true in certain respects because venture capital is, is sort of in South Africa also seen maybe a little bit misconstrued as the, as the answer to, to, to my, to my success, you know, so there are definitely a supply and demand issue, meaning there's not enough capital chasing our amazing entrepreneurs. Yes. Um, the VCs are very specific around their mandates. Um, and, and if one falls into the mandate of a VC and just to explain that in plain English, you know, any VC signs a contract with their investors saying we will invest in innovation driven businesses with proven traction that needs to be post revenue. So if, yes. if, if knife capital, for instance, if I, if someone says, listen, if I ask them, how much money did you make last year? And they say, no, 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 not zero. I'm only making money next year. Then knife capital is off the table. You've done, you haven't done your homework. Then you, you should rather go to some of the seed funders or an angel or whatever. So whether it is 40 I capital, knife capital, Kalon, Newtown partners, edge growth, Kingston capital. I mean, there are not many, but there are more and more and more VCs in the space more new emerging fund managers that the SASME fund have backed, black um, fund managers coming up. There's, there's a lot of interesting activity in this space. And I don't personally feel, maybe because I'm plugged into the ecosystem, that people are elusive. I mean, they, 
Their websites are there. You need to send them a well-developed pitch deck, lots of data on that kind of stuff, or find a, a semi-warm intro, meaning come to forums like these, listen to what we say, be a kid. You know, um, I, 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 well, interesting what you, what you said. Please see attached. Is it, I, I see it's in within your mandate, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we, you would know, Andile. I mean, I mean, most of the VCs are very out there trying to educate the market, trying to, yes. to get thought leadership going around the space. It's the only way South Africa is going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps here is, is, is through all these amazing entrepreneurs. We don't support them enough as an ecosystem. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, but then again, I, I agree with that system, it, 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 that statement. It is, it is still very difficult to get this funding. You know, there's, yes. there's just not enough of us. And, and, and the, ones, the ones that are there are also building our own business models. You know, we also yes. sort of had to build the funding side for the entrepreneurs to come and luckily Absolutely. they are coming and, and, and we're doing some interesting Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And I guess there's organizations such as Simodisa that you and I serve on that people can go into and, and consult with to find the list of the VCs. I think SASME Fund, as you already mentioned, is also a good start. So in terms of who they are yeah. and knowing them and talking to them, I think you could, but I think it's fair to say, you know, it's an underdeveloped sector and as you already mentioned. Keep before you go, no, no, very no, interesting no, question, million dollar question. Which business would you say in South, is South Africa's next billion dollar startup? Now there's a question. <laughs> Well, I'll have, to be, I'll, I'll have to be, uh, I have to back our own companies and say it's something yes. like uh, the, the AI for manufacturing business, which, uh, which we just, we backed and they just raised a $6 million round, which is data profits. Um, but, um, you know, there are some other amazing businesses like Aerobotics, like Yoko, like Intersect, like Peach Payments, like, I mean, there's, 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 there's a, a lot of those type of things. I would uh, I would back pineapple and uh, it would, would be unfair to to put a current company out of the loop. But to be quite <laughs> honest, just to put it on record, we are not in the business of believing that th this unicorn billion dollar yeah. business is is is, yeah. is 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 that is that is more of a Silicon Valley model. It's got different elements to the to the ecosystem. Yeah. We we as Knife Capital believe more in so-called gazelles, and I mean, you can expand on that, but just high yes. growth businesses growing 50%, 80%, 60% right. year on year. I mean, yeah. and that sounds like a lot, but from a low base, it's not. Yeah. That grow into $20 million businesses or, or, yeah. or 100 million rand businesses, you know, yeah. which, which it's more about growth lifestyle business is the best kind of business. Uh, brother, let me let you go. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. I know how busy a man you are. We really appreciate you for joining us. With the rest of the panel, we continue yeah. though. So ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere um, because I'm pretty sure many of the other entrepreneurs that are part of the program today will be able to weigh in on some of your questions. The Q&A keeps going. Please send more questions through. I'm going to go through some of the ones that I already have all the way until 11.30 with the entrepreneurs that are in the room. I'm interested uh, to my tag team there, brothers, um, from my brand. Uh, you've heard from Rob. You've heard from Keith. You've heard some of the insights they have around funding <laughs> and what funders are looking for. You heard the five uh, principles that certainly Knife Capital look for, product, customer, team, business model, funding. W what do you guys think? Salvatore? Um, uh, yeah, it was actually very interesting, uh, Dile. I think we're going to take a long, hard look at our our model and our plan, and uh, maybe try to put it down in more uh, exact words or um, more definitively on what we're trying to do and where, where, we, where we want to take the business. Um, Great. I'm glad it's helping you out and hopefully it's helping many other people out there. TD, let me come to you. Your first question that uh, I got first comes to you. Um, how much did it cost you to build the app? That's the question. And maybe did you fund it yourself? Um, yes, the app was funded by Dinini Consulting, which is a company. And um, when we calculate the cost of bringing the developers on board and start working on the app, it actually like, costed us less than like 250K. 250K? Yeah. And that company, is it your company or do you have to go and pitch to them and raise the 250? It's my company. Ah, so basically you funded yourself. 
Yes. <laughs> ah, love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Gabente, the next question is for you. How do you get over the fraud issue that could arise from not inspecting people's insured items versus their claims? So that's a, a, a very interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure if you've ever used the app, but essentially what we have the ability to do is categorize certain items as potentially high risk items when people are insuring them. And uh, if somebody uses the app to insure one of these items, so for instance, an example of such an item is a drone as well as a cell phone. So what we require you to do um, as an addition to the insurance flow is that we require you to add additional supporting images of that item. So if it's a cell phone, we require you to add a, a picture of the state of the screen of the cell phone. If it's a drone, we require you to take a, an additional picture of the drone in flight just for us to confirm um, that the drone actually works and that there's no pre-existing damage. So that's our first um, sort of blocker towards fraud. And secondly, one thing that we realized, we, we actually started to take a, a deep dive into what actually causes fraud. Why do people feel the need to, to commit fraud? And the, the, the number one reason that we ended up coming down to is A, people don't feel as if they get value from the insurance company, if that makes sense. People feel as if on a month-to-month -month basis, they keep paying these premiums, but they never see any activity happening with regards to those premiums. So they don't really understand what happens with those premiums. Therefore, they feel as if they are morally justified when they commit fraud because they need to get something else from this um, product that they're paying for on a month-to-month -month basis. So that boils back to the transparency issue that I, I talked about when I, I first came into the, um, the discussion, whereby if you actually give people a breakdown of what actually happens with that premium. So for instance, on the app, whenever somebody makes a claim and your premium sort of helps to pay that person's claim, we give you a, a notification in the app just to complete that, that social feedback. So no longer, is it a, no longer is insurance seen as a, an economic transaction, but it's now a social, con social construct, contract, a social interaction. Therefore, you feel more of a, you feel a connection to the people who yes, you're helping, so you're less inclined to, to sort of mm. affect them by being... So, so you guys, have you been able to raise funding to help kind of scale Pineapple? And how was that experience for you if you have? Yes, yes, we have. Um, so it was the, the first time the seed, rounding, the seed round of funding was, was relatively easier. And that's because, um, you know, the, the investment came from the company that was running that competition, right? So they had a, a long amount of time to actually study the business, to understand how it works, to see the technology and so forth. So they had a lot of comfort um, with giving us that initial round of funding. And then the subsequent round after that was a bit more tricky because we were trying to go for a more exotic structure of financing, which is you know, on a convertible note basis, as opposed to um, straight equity. And yeah. um, it, was a bit, it was a bit harder to get that one across the finish line because it's, it's not as common of a financial structure for um, you know, startups in SA, it's more common in in the US, not necessarily SA, but eventually we managed to get that across the, the finish line. But of course, raising funding is, is never really a straightforward and easy um, task. Yes. It, it takes time, a lot of patience. And, and you're always doing it, isn't it? You're always in the process of raising it. Maybe that, that, that could be my parting shot to you is, how do you make sure that as, as the leading team, you focus on building the business which is getting more and more customers to sign up and buy your product, as opposed to spending time raising the capital that will fund your runway. Because the two are related, right? If you're able to scale exactly. kind of the new customers and the revenue, then you need less money to cover a runway because your cash flows from your day-to-day -day activities are adequate to fund the growth. H how do you balance the yeah. two in the team? So one thing that we learned early on and one thing that really started to help us was that we would send out frequent status updates to potential investors or people that we had once had a conversation with. So what we do at Pineapple is if we have even just one conversation with you as a potential funder, we add you to a, a mailing list that we have. And we basically maintain this mailing list and send out basically monthly, um, let's call it status updates as to how the business is doing where we are and so forth. And that really, really helped us a lot because we found that once you come to your subsequent round of raising capital, 
you no longer have to have these conversations from the ground up. You've built that strong layer of rapport. Therefore, you tend to spend less time, you know, just trying to on-ramp and get that conversation back to sort of where it was before. And you can now focus and spend more time on actual business-related activities. That was really good. Thank you so much, Ndabentle, for that. Rob, I have a question here for you as well. Um, do you do wireframes and limited functional apps for startups, um, say with little budgets, but need something to showcase or to pitch? And I guess this is uh, uh, something that's a little bit more kind of early stage technology to showcase uh, what, the, what, what the application may eventually do at kind of full pace. Do, do you do that kind of stuff? Yeah, in fact, sometimes it seems like we do more of that than actual development, especially recently with lockdown, like funding is tighter to come by. So rather than people having the funds to build the whole app, they have enough for us to design um, a prototype. And we, we have a variety of approaches, but yeah, we, we do a lot of prototype and we have our own design team. Um, we have got a fixed process around the flow of the architecture of the app and then wireframes and then the design. Uh, but yeah, we... We do it a lot, and it does help with the investment um, process. You know, even getting in front of a, an angel investor is quite tricky, but if you can send them a, a link on WhatsApp to a prototype, they open it, and a, a well-designed app, the first screen explains what it does. I often talk about Uber, very complicated thing, but it just works. You open it, and you type where you go, and, and the complexity is hidden from the user. And then any app that requires a tour instructions, guidelines, and I'm being a little bit flippant here because some do require them, but they shouldn't. A well-designed app, home screen should just should explain everything that that app does. Absolutely. Now, let me move on back to you, um, gentlemen. Um, at my brand, you, you were earlier on explaining to me when we had the initial conversation, kind of call it the journey that the business has taken. You are in the middle of buying back some of that equity from the initial investor. You, you, you kind of back to basics in a way. Um, you've had the experience of initially charging the advertisers up front, but then you decided to go with building the audience first. Where are you now in terms of business model? So what's your thinking around kind of building a business that's able to generate revenue and billing someone for the service um, and maybe covering that runway with some funding potentially from, from the investors? What are your thoughts? Where are you at now? What's next? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Kiriakos and I, my brand obviously led us to uh, starting a full-fledged solutions provider company. Uh, so we have quite a few projects that we're doing now, both locally and abroad. So we have clients in Germany, um, the States, uh, and then guys locally that we're developing software for. So um, that is definitely our, our main cash cow. That's what allow us, allows us to, to operate as kind of this think tank where we can um, carry on experimenting with my brand. Um, but yeah, I, I think we've got that luxury that we have the income coming in, so we can sort of tinker with our product. Um, and, and that's kind of where it's at, you know, trying to test different functions in different locations and see what works and what doesn't, and get a, a first-hand um, look at, at these things. You see, the, the biggest problem is for us, there's no way we can go Google, you know, how something's done or what works and what does it. We carry up us now in a, in a very untouched field and under-researched field. Um, in terms of the kind of data that we're dealing with it, and especially in the South African market, the, the kind of stuff that we're doing isn't being done. So um, you do need to kind of give yourself that space as a think tank so your, your R&D can kind of progress. So um, we are lucky enough to have that income. Um, and with regards to the app, my brand specifically, we found that we, we're in a unique position where if someone's opening our app, they're a shopper. You know, it's not like Facebook where they could just be a 17-year-old that doesn't, that doesn't shop. Uh, or someone that doesn't want to shop right now. Whereas with our app, if you're opening our app, you are a shopper and you are looking to shop. Uh, so we're hoping that through collaborative filtering and through getting, gathering as much data, not only about the user, but about the product that they're looking at and then try to get a, a better understanding of what they like and isolate different customers. These are my grocery store shoppers. These are my furniture shoppers. These are my tech shoppers. And we're hoping that that you, that, uh, Isolated and specific data uh, can create value in the business, especially for retailers where, where they want to put something out to grocery guys, to tech guys, to computer guys specifically. We're hoping to be able to have that database. And also the, the problems also, they come as you go. Like um, things always seem, and I'm sure the other guys who have 
who have been involved in Dev will tell you, things always seem easier and you never consider the execution in something. So for example, when we had our, our first thousand stores on the app that had come through our first big client, we didn't consider the amount of data. So we were sitting on maybe a thousand to 2000 pieces of content a month. As soon as we activated my brand provincially, um, we find we're dealing with 100, 200,000 pieces of content. And it wasn't just a matter of put a feed and show the content to the user. That's when you need to start thinking about AI and machine learning. So you've got 1,000 pieces of content, 100,000 pieces of content. The user's only going to swipe five times. You need to show him of the 100,000, 10 pieces that are relevant. So the problems scale up and you only start seeing these things kind of once, once you've got your hands in the dirt, then you start actually realizing how much is involved with your product. Um, I have no doubt in my mind, gentlemen, that you are onto something unique. And I'll tell you why. With my experience in the media industry, there is no doubt that advertisers, particularly your kind of advertisers, who, um, or your kind of platform, rather, that's on the basis of what my favorite brand is. So if I shop at Checkers and not at Pick and Pay or vice versa, I know that I have shop right down the street from my house and I would love to get a notification of the latest specials or if something is going on, right? I'm not going to wait for buying a newspaper or, or however else they advertise, particularly retailers. So there's no doubt that they have to find a way to get onto the digital space. The question is how and how do you build it in a way that's compelling for them? But there is absolutely no doubt that that's where the audiences are. That's where people are transacting. If the thing is being delivered to me, I should be able to transact and maybe get my Woolies delivery to be kind of done. I don't have to go to a Woolworths.co.za to go into the, I don't know, fridge area and then buy my chicken. Surely there's got to be a way that if I decide I'm a Woolies client, Woolies must be able to talk to me in a way that makes sense, but in a central way as maybe spa and shop right, etc. So I, I, I like the fact that you've got um, other parts of the business that are becoming the money spinner, but I want to encourage you not to give up on this. I think you're absolutely onto something. And a lot of times people just do what they've always done just because it's what they've always done. But, you know, relying on entrepreneurs like you to go and keep knocking and banging on the door and saying, hey, there is something a lot more compelling. So I would encourage you to continue, boys. Um, Tiri, that. let me come to you. The question I have for you is scale, my sister, because schools, children, transport companies, how do we make this business all over South Africa? Um, have you thought through kind of the route to market that makes it really, really scale up? Um, so far, the, the app is, is, is actually available countrywide. And the market tools that we are using for now is uh, um, social media. And we are also getting lots of um, t interviews, uh, whether it's uh, TV interviews and radio interviews. So that's what makes uh, people want to, um, to sign up because uh, the app is actually addressing the social needs. And um, I was talking to the Department of Education as well, because they also have a scholar transport uh, programs that they are running. And they are also um, coming on board. Um, I just need to tie up a few knots here and there so that they can be on board. And the other marketing uh, strategy is the word of mouth, especially because sometimes the parents, they are the one who will approach the school or will approach the scholar transport driver to say that they want to get notified. And especially now with the uh, uh, temperature field that has been um, um, integrated into the, into the app, they want to know whether the children, they were picked up in the right temperature, they arrived at school in the right temperature. So that's how we do the marketing so far. So, so and the reason why I asked the question, thanks for that, because it gives me a nice sense. But I would imagine that if there's one central place you are going to get all of those stakeholders come to is the school. Um, the transport companies have to be allowed to be able to drop the kids off. The parents are obviously the customers because they take their kids to that school and pay school fees. And the school mm -hmm. is incentivized to keep the parents happy. So, you know, and there's a very finite list of schools all over South Africa. I guess you can always cut that up into suburbia and LSM levels, etc. The parents that actually pay transport companies to deliver, uh, sorry, to drop off their kids. But that, that applies in most communities. Um, even in townships, yeah. they are very well, they are, they are companies that drop off kids at school. So, so the question I have is if you thought through potentially going through the school governing bodies or the school mm -hmm. associations, 
um, and, and, and maybe trying to take it from that perspective, just from a sign up kind of point of view. Because I could hear the radio interview, I could see the social mm. media, but I may not know mm. that my school offers this thing. Okay. Um, yes, that's another approach for the schools, especially the, uh, the public schools uh, that have the SGBs. Uh, I do make meetings with them and uh, explain exactly how this is going to work and how is it going to safeguard their children and give the credibility to the school that they, they put safety uh, first. And um, with the scholar transport drivers, I talk to the associations themselves. And um, like one of the panelists mentioned that when, uh, the, the, when you speak to other people, they think that when the app is downloaded, you're actually getting something out of it. So sometimes they push back because they think that they're going to make me rich and they're not going to get anything out of, out of the app. I might say it's free, but when they use their own data, I'm going to be charging their money somehow. I don't know how I told them to give me ideas in terms of how I can do that. Uh, but I, I, I talked to, talk to them and the, the parents as well. When they have the parents meeting that, uh, like one of the schools, they had a parent meeting. I'll go there and do a presentation to the parents and explain to them how the app works. Very interesting because I would imagine schools have got all of those databases. They're not, they talk to parents all the time. They WhatsApping me, they texting me, they emailing me. So, you know, if, if there is some way of reaching agreement with the schools of South Africa and being able to access those databases at some kind of commercial arrangement with the school, it could be interesting. But good luck, my sister. Thank you also for joining us today. I really appreciate your time and I love your story. And I really wish that you're able to scale and grow it amazingly. Rob, um, I have a specific question for you, but you may also want to piggyback on some of the comments so far from the entrepreneurs. The question comes in the following way. Guys, is it possible to build an app for government departments? And if so, how do I even start and how do I pitch it? Now, you're a man with experience in building applications. Have you had to deal with our wonderful government and uh, try and pitch a wonderful application for them? We have built some apps for government, South Africa and, and in other parts of Africa, and we kind of decided not to do it too much anymore. Um, it's difficult, you know, the, the procurement process, you know, when people talk about corruption, the problem with corruption, the flip side of corruption is the process for winning a tender is very, very bureaucratic, and you need a lot of paperwork. And so you as an entrepreneur one-man startup probably will not have a chance because you will not have the certificate, the references, the reams and reams of documentation that are required. So it is very difficult for a startup to, to, to win a big tender. Um, there are different channels into government. We're not experts at that, but it's, it, it's very difficult to, to, as a startup, to win big yeah. tenders for government. I also find that they generally very bureaucratic, slow yeah. moving, not that open to new ideas. Um, so, and, and very formulaic, they, they yeah. require an app to do this. And often we've gone to them and said, we could build you an app, that'll cost a million bucks. But actually this exists in America, in Europe, in Africa, you pay $20 a month and you get the same thing and it's better and it works. Why don't you, like we won't build it. You just go and here's a link, you sign up and you get this. <laughs> for cheap. Yeah. And they're like, no, because we need to own it. We must build it. So this is very, uh, I don't know, old, old school. In absolutely, that absolutely. I totally agree with you. And it, it makes it difficult for them to innovate, isn't it? Because we've got all of these yeah. amazing entrepreneurs on this panel and also tuning in who may have all these ideas. I'm sure this question came because somebody has an idea. Um, to add to what you're saying, the other problem, of course, is that the way government it, it procures and the way the rules are written, it's on the basis that they must first know what they want, all the way to writing a specification of what they want, and the market must give it to them. The problem with innovation yeah. is that that's just turned the other way around. The problem with innovation is I may give you something that solves the problem, but you never would have thought that's the solution you wanted. So, so it doesn't lend itself to being able to walk up to a department and pitch an idea because then they'll tell you about tender notices and all the bureaucracy that you refer to. Anyway, so thanks for answering that. The other point I wanted you to reflect on is this question of scaling.
because as you've noticed, I've already asked the guys from uh, uh, my brand and also TD uh, with her application, Lokchansi, on how then do you scale? In other words, get more and more customers. Your parting shot on you're an entrepreneur, you built an application, you want to now start generating the income. We heard the advice that came from Keith. How do I scale? How do I grow? Each app is different. I think often, again, there's a temptation to, to try and do everything yourself and not do partnerships. So um, it could be working with, you know, look, Chansey, existing apps for parents and schools in the private sector, like the D6 Communicator. Um, you, and kind of goes back to the, the issue of government and bureaucracy and slow moving. And you can approach your schools. It's a nice way to win a lot of parents, but actually potentially having a 15 second video on WhatsApp that can go to parents. Parents are on WhatsApp, they share that, they apply the pressure to the school. So kind of thinking of different marketing channels, which isn't just about paying for Google ads or Facebook ads, but working with existing businesses, maybe old school real world businesses, where you can complement what they're doing. Maybe you go and target um, you know, one of our apps we thought was an app for the public. It turned out by accident it was an app for security companies to, to provide to their clients. So I think sometimes you have to be a little bit creative. Uh, I think there's also a temptation to, to just throw money at the problem. So yeah. even with Google AdWords and Facebook is, is you can get a lot of traffic with not a lot of money, but is that traffic buying? And, and it's a case of testing small budget yeah. A, B, try this, try this, try this, YouTube, Facebook, Insta, yeah. Google. Okay, this seems to work. Let's try another version of that. That seems to work. Okay, yeah. we've got a formula. We're tracking it. We know they're converting. Now let's spend the money. Brilliant stuff. Guys, I want to thank you all for being with us. Rob, thanks for those closing words. TD, Keith in his absence, uh, and Davente, Salvatore. Kriakos, thank you guys for making the time this morning. I hope everybody else that out there that tuned in this morning uh, did enjoy this session. I hope it's given you a bit more of a perspective on how you can take a great idea, great application, all the way to a great business. I hope the experiences that have been shared by everybody on how they did it in their own way is going to assist you to do that. I'm going to hand over now to my good friend, Andrew McHenry. He's the co-chair of Mobile Monday, and he's going to wrap up the session for us and tell you and I how to make sure we participate in this wonderful competition called App of the Year. My brother? Sometimes we forget just how fast things are moving. New technology has enabled the development of newer technology moving us forward, a lot <laughs> faster and faster. Now, we're blazing into the fourth industrial revolution and things are moving so fast, the present is merging with the future. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are already disrupting the way we work, live and drive. Robotics and nanotechnology are breaking barriers in medicine and manufacturing. Virtual reality is reshaping the potential of entertainment and education. And the Internet of Things is connecting appliances, devices and people in a way that never seemed possible. It's the start of a new chapter in human development. Now is the time to face the fourth industrial revolution head on. Now is the time to look ahead and consider the implications of 4IR. Now is the time to rethink everything from business to government to the future of humanity itself. To be left behind is to lose control because the fourth industrial revolution is here and things are only going to keep moving faster. Well, it's a wrap. Um, I did a bit of an opener and now I've got the tough job of closing. So I want to say thanks to everybody that was uh, part of that last panel. Simply amazing stuff. And Dide, yeah, inspirational. Um, for me, being involved with MTN App of the Year has been an amazing journey. Um, and I've got a surprise guest that I'm going to bring on. In fact, he's not a surprise. He was just on a few minutes ago. Kind of Im improv, um, bring him on because I think he really adds to the story and what we're doing here at MTN App of the Year.
So I'm going to ask um, Rob McLean to come on from App Developer Studio. I know he was just with us now. Because I really think that um, Rob and I share something very special about the MTN App of the Year. And in chatting about it in terms of why I wanted Rob to come on is because I think the, the story goes like this. I think, um, Rob, how many apps have you submitted to MTN App of the Year? I uh, believe it's between 12 and 15, Andrew. 12 and 15. I think it's been going for uh, 9 or 10 years, so that's more than one app per year. How many times have you won? Oh, good question. Never, Andrew. Right. So that, that, and that's, that's why I wanted Rob to come on and, and chat to you all, because share his experience, because for me, that's the, real, that's the real prize. The real winner is Rob and his company. A um, couple of uh, nominations. You've been nominated a couple of times. We've been shortlisted a few times, yes. So, so again, it's not about getting the, the silver, the bronze, the gold, being the winner. It's actually about um, participating in the, in the process. Um, I've been a, a judge for many, many years. Mobile Monday has been involved since the beginning. And um, I really thought that Rob coming up here and sharing um, some of his, his uh, moments with us in terms of participating in the event, um, while you haven't won, it has afforded you the opportunity to build a business. Yeah, we've created a business off the back of of getting into apps, meeting people like yourself, introductions, getting shortlisted, won as clients, and now we, yeah, one of the biggest app development companies in, in South Africa, and, and building, we've built over 100 apps, employ a lot of people, um, and very successful, but it's, it's not necessarily through winning, it's through determination, and, uh, and just keeping your eyes open, looking at out what's out there, taking the opportunity. So for me, that's, that's the real, the real uh, story behind MTN App of the Year um, and why I'm part of it. Because I also put you on the spot because we spoke earlier before getting our story straight. Um, you're actually looking for people to join your company. Yeah, we are. We, we're looking to grow, in particular, the development team. Um, Front-end developers mainly, particular Flutter and Native. So yeah, if, if people are interested, looking for internships or secondments or some work experience, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're recruiting. So that's how I opened the session, was that um, to, to be part of the App um, Academy and to, to, to build the apps and submit. I think we had over 100 apps or so submitted as part of the App Academy. Um, and that's, you know, wherever I look on different job postings, there's tons and tons of uh, positions for, for people to, for developers to, to join companies. And, and I thought when I was chatting to Rob before I had to come on and do the closing, I thought it's a great end to this whole, you know, uh, five weeks, some people say six weeks, um, geek culture. I was just chatting to the guys at geek, Sh geek Culture. They've been coming here, I think, three times a week for the last five or six weeks. A big shout out and thanks to them as well. You know, this, this whole initiative has been phenomenal. Um, this last panel we had now, we had some VCs, we had some past winners come on. You know, this, this whole um, MTN app of the year, MTN business, um, sponsoring, you know, amazing. This is just getting bigger and bigger and better and better. Yeah. And uh, Rob coming up here saying he's looking for developers. It's all about that. It's about you honing your skills, looking for, for work, looking for opportunities. It's all here. Yeah. You know, you just got to know where to look. Um, some parting words. We talked about how do people network? I mean, obviously, you're here talking to them. You talked about LinkedIn. Tell us about LinkedIn quickly. Yeah, so, so I mean, we've realized over the years that networking is super important and it's not, doesn't come naturally to me. I'm not a extrovert, um, but I've forced myself to attend events, to make notes, to, to see who's out there, to do my research. And, and, and LinkedIn, I've realized, has, is a massive popular network. It is the social media for, for work. Um, and so getting on there, doing research, getting up to speed on the articles. There's so massive material out there to get yourself up to speed because I think, as Andrew's saying, everyone who's done the App Academy, awesome first step to get you somewhere. The, ne the question is, where next? Um, and some real life experience on some real business problems, some real apps, and hopefully we can, we can help a few people with that. But it's only by understanding the real trends, the real successes that are out there in the economy some specific to South Africa, some things that are working in Asia, US that aren't here yet. So let's kind of go look at that and whether that can work locally. So, yeah. Thanks for that, Rob. I think, yeah, uh, we're not getting paid by LinkedIn. It's just a great tool. <laughs> and I really want to encourage you to, to get on there. If you're not on there now, get on there. Um, you can find Rob on there. You can find me. I think everybody that was on the panel, um, certainly, you know, Kit from, from NAF is on there as well. 
Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to, to have Rob come up and, and just uh, spend a bit of time with me because for me, it's, it's not about Mobile Monday. It's not about the judging. It's actually about, you know, connecting with people like Rob. We've known each other for years and years yeah. and years now. And um, for me, it's, it's, it's a story that I wanted to, to, to share. And thank you for coming up and, and participating in my, my closing session because um, in, in, in wrapping up, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not about winning the trophy, like I said before. It's really about, um, you know, starting. You've already made that first step. Um, loads of apps have been submitted. Don't forget the deadline. I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to come through in, in, uh, in the, the competition this year. I think we're going to get some great surprises. And again, what's going to happen next year? Hopefully this, this pandemic thing will have uh, hopefully, you know, changed our lives and we will get together and be not having to rely on LinkedIn and other social media platforms to connect and we won't have to do this like virtual green thing, green stage thing and see each other in person because I'm a people person. So I look forward to seeing you um, in person, um, hopefully in 2021. And if not, um, reach out to me on the social channels. I just wanted to, um, again, say thanks to MTN Business, yeah. um, Geek Culture, um, you know, Creative Space Media, and everyone who's been involved in this, this, uh, this program. It's been phenomenal, and I feel very privileged to be part of it, and I think it's going to be a, a, a great uh, end to this whole event. So without further ado, I'm going to say thank you, and we'll see you at the awards. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to the MTN Business App of the Year Awards 2019! Awesome event. We are seeing the best apps, we are seeing the best innovation, and of course it's powered by the Boza Network, MTN. This is the heart of innovation. We build the rails, we put the trains, and then these guys are putting the passengers and experiences on that. To be a value-adding experience, you need to have applications. At the core of the digital economy, it's a service economy, and the services is delivered through an application. We are actually building new businesses, we are digitalizing all businesses, and that is delivered through innovation, and that comes through an application, and that's what we're here for tonight. We've been working very hard to be where we are today. You know, it's a challenge at all times, but we have to... I feel this is like the happiest day I think of my life is yeah, this is like the first thing I've ever learned actually. <laughs> I think the journey of any entrepreneur is one of an absolute roller coaster. There's big ups, there's big highs, there's big lows, but days like today when the people choose us for an award really makes it all worth it. The opportunity that they've put forward is amazing. To say, listen, there's a category here that you want to apply for, and the journey's been great. Because MTN is such a big company with a lot of clients, and I think the support that they're going to provide for me will be very amazing. So MTN is a major player on the continent, and as we expand out of South Africa, we hope to be working with them. Winning this award, it means now we have more responsibility you know we cannot complain about certain things especially now we are working with MTN as a big company so we need to be focusing to make sure that we create more value for our users and we create more value for all our stakeholders that are involved. This is the ultimate prize that allows the winners a chance of a lifetime at the tech summit of their choice. Yeah, look, it's obviously a great privilege to us because we recognize there are so many people that have done amazing things in this space. And tonight we saw so many apps that are making real impact on communities and changing the lives of people in South Africa. Everywhere you go, MTN.